think the quadra trial was really important that it had 460 uh, some odd patients that were heavily pretreated. So what I think that we we're trying to do with the quadra data is we had development of PARPs which started in treatment of patients who had BRCA mutated tumors. Uh, it was germline, and then expanded into germline and somatic BRCA treatment. And then we kind of switched and we had all the really good data coming out with maintenance therapy. But there was this gap, can we use PARP inhibition in, in all comers? So Quadra looked at all comers and then they kind of um, took out some data points looking at patients who had BRCA mutations and patients who had HRD uh, genomic scarring and then all the all, uh, then all comers. And really what, what they did is when they looked at and they saw the patients who had BRCA mutations treated at fourth line or greater, they had excellent response rates for platinum sensitive, platinum resistant, as well as platinum refractory. So they had really good response rates in, in all comers with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. And then again, to expand the indication using HRD and patients who had the HRD genomic scar, but not a BRCA mutation, um, and those patients who were platinum eligible, those patients had durable responses as well with respect to having PARP inhibition at that time. So I think this data is definitely practice changing. What it does is it's taken our portfolio of, of PARP inhibitors, where we should use them, and, and it expanded it to additional therapy and it expanded it to, to HRD. Again, the label is for, for fourth line therapy or, or, or longer. But again, I think um, looking at if you had a patient who came in at second or third line, she had a, a BRC mutation, platinum sensitive recurrence. This is somebody who said, you know, Tom, I drive an hour and a half from West Virginia. I really do not want to be driving back and forth for chemotherapy. It's it's something that I would prefer. Some sometimes their copays may be higher for, for the for the for the chair time instead of the instead of the oral agent. But I actually used a PARP inhibitor on a patient who um, who couldn't make the drive and she just wanted to come in once a month for labs and she thought that that was a better way to go. And again, there's many clinical trials at that time looking at this, but I think the quadra data is practice changing in that it shows that it's expanding the indication. It's shown that you can use it in heavily pretreated patient because in the quadra trial, a significant portion of these patients had six lines or greater. So to say somebody's had fourth line, fifth line therapy, we shouldn't use PARP inhibition. Neuroparib is showing that you can use that at the six line uh, treatment for, for these patients. So I think it's been a nice uh, addition to the portfolio, which again gives us, gives us choices uh, and options to give to, to patients when we're sitting down talking to, with them in, in the clinic. I think that looking at the data that um, using a biomarker in this heavily pretreated patient group is, is, is appropriate. Do I think that if they would have used it in less pretreated patients, would they have had different responses? And I think anybody would say yes, as we move these drugs up in drug development. Um, but I think that this met an unmet need. This is something that we're starting to see more often and that patients are, are living longer. We're having to figure out what can we give them for fourth, fifth, sixth line therapy. So I think that's a very nice addition. And I also think that it's looking at molecular uh, signals. So again, we have to pay attention. Is the patient BRCA positive? Did we have this HRD test? And so to me, I think it's really trying to um, take the biomarker and apply it to the patient even further down the line when most of us would say at fifth line therapy or sixth line therapy, the chance of response is five to 10%. And when you're looking at the response rates in, in quadra, they're much higher than that, especially for BRCA in the 40, 30% range. So to me, those are pretty remarkable response rates. And again, I kind of, you know, quoted some of the, the, the Topasio data, which I think is very important, combination neuroparib with IO, getting, uh, getting a good disease control rate in a very challenging group of patients to treat. So I think that those are very good um, studies done by uh, Tassar GSK, which have, have given us options to talk about with our patients. And again, to me, the more options, the more um, options we have for our patients, that means the more treatment that we can hopefully give them later on. So I think in the platinum resistant or platinum not eligible patients, in the quadra trial, they looked at, uh, at BRCA. So you had to have a BRCA1 or 2 germline or somatic mutation. And, and I agree with that. I think if you have that, you should be able to use single agent neuroparib. But I would also say that if you didn't have those mutations and you didn't have the HRD because in the platinum ineligible or platinum resistant patient, that's when they would use the HRD test. So HRD positive test, platinum, um, you had to be platinum sensitive. But if you had the uh, HRD test and you're platinum insensitive, it's not an indication. But I would take those patients and I would say that it's not that single agent neuroparib cannot be used. Um, it didn't bore out in, in the quadra data, but what I would say is take the Topasio data, which is combination neuroparib and immunotherapy, use that combination for those folks at that time because I think that that would get you a good disease control rate because when you look at that trial, those patients were heavily pretreated as well.